Some years ago, it was about um, the late noughties, we were, um, as a church, extending our premises. Uh, I should say my original profession was a chartered building surveyor, which I don't know whether it has traction here or not, but it's like a mini architect. So I love building and buildings. I understand the process, and uh, so I really enjoyed looking around the building that you've got that you're all going to be moving into soon here. Um, because of that background, I get tasked with leading the building projects. So on our Bradford campus at home, I've, I've project-led three major multi-million pound building projects there. And the third, the last one I did, was about a two million pound extension. Um, we'd put hours and hours and lots of money and preparation into this. And I remember the day I got a phone call to say, oh, Steve, the architect's here, and he says he's got the contract for you to sign. And I went, yes, this is a good day. Up he comes to my office, I'm bright and cheery, he walks in, shakes me by the hand, sits down. And then it suddenly struck me, he wasn't even wearing a jacket, he just had a shirt on, wasn't carrying anything. And I said to him, I thought you were bringing the contract. He said, oh, it's coming. And then suddenly into my office staggered one of the young men in his office, from his office, with three boxes that were kind of that deep. You know, like boxes of photocopier paper. I just staggered in with the... And sort of dropped them on the desk, doom! And he kind of went, whew, it's one for you, one for us, one for the builder. Each one was the contract. And on the top sheet was, you know, sign here, please. <laughs> <clears throat> so I looked at this document, which had every plan, every piece of concrete steel, nut, bolt, light bulb, piece of wire, everything listed. Um, all the terms and conditions, what would happen if anything went wrong, it's all there. I said, now I know why I pay you such a lot of money. <laughs> the, the, there's a lot of trust involved here now. So we had a bit of a laugh and I signed the top and off they went. Didn't think any more about it. The work started. Now it's an extension, remember. So every day I drive to the church office, the building's going up. I loved it. You know, the hard hats and the high-vis jackets and the, all the diggers and everything. You see the steel come up and it's like, yeah, love it. And one day I arrived, it was a bit quiet. And I thought to myself, hmm, not much on, you know, going on today. Go to my office, phone rings, architect, Steve, we have a problem. Okay. The builder went bust last night. They're not coming back. And I went into meltdown mode. I kind of went, what? He says, sorry, I, they're not coming back. Well, there must be a way. No, I'm sorry, they're not coming back. My mind went to all the holes in the roof, all the wires that were hanging out, you know, all the stuff that, I'm like, what's going to happen now? And he picked up my panic. He says, calm down. Remember that contract that you signed? I said, yeah, that is now going to save your life. That's the words he uses. It's now going to save your life. Because in the contract were all the terms and conditions that would kick in if this eventuality happened. And long story short, it did. He began to operate based on the conditions in this contract, got other people to come in and do various stuff. We saved money in the long run, believe it or not, because of the whole process. But at that time, I just happened, just happened, to be reading the book of Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah is a builder, right? Some of you know, Nehemiah was the man commissioned by God to rebuild the broken down walls of Jerusalem. So as I'm reading Nehemiah with this real life situation going on around me, I began to look at it through slightly different eyes because the contract had saved my life. The contract was helping us to get the building up even though there'd been some problems. And I began to look in Nehemiah's book for whether there was any kind of contract between his builders. And I, I came to the conclusion there was. There were some things that every person who rebuilt those walls passionately believed and bought into. And they had a kind of building agreement, if I can call it that. Yes. Well, it wasn't a pile of paper but there were some things that they together believed 
and gave their lives for so that the Jerusalem could be restored. Now, the importance of Jerusalem is simply this. Back in the day, it was God's address. So if you were from you know, any nationality and you heard about the God of Israel, oh, God of Israel, he's supposed to be blessing his people, he's supposed to be a great God. Hmm, they say he's the one true God. I must go and explore and, and find out more about the God of Israel. Where is he? And they would say, Jerusalem. There's his temple. In fact, there's a, there's a sanctuary there. They call it the Holy of Holies. And there's a box in there called the Ark of the Covenant, which is the physical representation of God in heaven on earth. Wow. I must go see this. So I get on my donkey and I trot across the desert to Jerusalem, looking for the address of Almighty God. And when I get there, it's in ruins. The walls are broken down. I mean, the, the, the temple doesn't even, it's not even there. It's been ripped to the ground, ravaged by invaders. The Babylonians had swept down and destroyed it. And I think to myself, ha, so much for the God of the Jews. So much for the great God of heaven. You see, when God's address is in ruins, he gets a bad reputation. God's city, God's house, his temple must fully represent him on the earth as it is in heaven. Now transfer it through to today. Where's God's house? Where does God live? He lives in you. And he lives in me. Peter says that each of us are like living stones being built together into a dwelling in which God lives by his Holy Spirit. So today, every single one of you who are a Christian that have God dwelling in you, your, our lives built together are the equivalent of that temple. So today when someone says, okay, well, where's the God of the Christians? And we say, well, where do you live? Grand Rapids. Okay, well, go down the point and you'll, you'll meet God. Will they? Yeah. And they'll walk in and they'll meet you. You say, I'm looking for God, you'll say, Hello, pleased to meet you, because I'm his child. Maybe I could introduce you to my dad. This is the house of God. This is the address of God in this community. You represent one expression of it. We know it's in the world. It's, it's covering the world. It's filling the earth. It's the house of God. But distinct communities that we call the local church are God's address in their respective community. Now, if people turn up here and they find the equivalent of what my tourist back in the day found, they find our lives a shambles. They find that we can't even agree with each other. There's the equivalent of holes in our walls and dysfunction and division. They're going to look at our lives and go, yeah, so much for the God of the Christians. And they're not going to be drawn to him. But if when they get here, they find what I found when I walked in this morning, a welcome, warmth, faith in the house, worship that lifts your head and makes you look higher, hope, future, hmm, possibility, that they're going to be attracted to, to go in a little bit further, to get to know us some more. The functioning local church is God's address in our community. But I want to suggest to you this morning... To build it well, we need kind of a building agreement with similar terms to what Nehemiah had with his builders. I want to show you this just quickly in the time I've got. When Nehemiah was working, he was, he was in Babylon. He was actually away from Jerusalem, hundreds of miles away. He'd been exiled, taken as part of the destruction of Jerusalem. And then one day, an ordinary day, got up, had his breakfast, went to work. And as part of his day, some friends of his came from the Jerusalem district. And he gets chatting to them. Tell me, how's it going in Jerusalem? And this is what we read in Nehemiah 1. He says, in the month of Kislev, while I was in the citadel of Susa, 
Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some of the men, and I questioned them about the remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. And they said to me, those who survived the exile are in great trouble and disgrace. Ooh. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates have been burned with fire. Now listen to this. He says, when I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. Then if you read on the rest of chapter 1, he launches into this long prayer of intercession. In a moment, suddenly, he felt something. Something got on him when he heard about the plight of God's house. And it got on him so badly, he fasted, he wept, he prayed, and he went to work the next day. Chapter 2 tells us that um, he worked in the palace for the king. So he, he wasn't a numpty, this guy. You know, he was a, he was, you do, kings don't have idiots around them, do they? They have smart, intelligent, happy people who make them smile and make their day great. People they can trust. So Nehemiah was a good man. But well, this day goes to work, and we read this. He says, In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year, when wine was brought to the king, I took it and gave it to him, and I'd not been sad in his presence before. So the king asked me, Why does your face look so sad when you're not ill? I mean, there was like a cloud over him, heaviness of heart. He said, This can be nothing but sadness of heart. <laughs> Nehemiah writes, I was very much afraid, but I said to the king, may the king live forever. Why should my face not look sad when the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins? And he goes on to explain the situation. Something got on him. He felt something. And then if you keep reading the story down, you discover that Nehemiah gets commissioned by the king to go back and be part of the answer. And he has to gather some other like-minded people to help him in the task. And I see in that an implicit term of agreement that all the people that rebuilt Jerusalem, God's address, felt something. They all felt what God felt. And I would suggest you will only build great church here if you all agree we feel what God feels. We feel what God feels for this city, for Grand Rapids, we feel what God feels for this expression of the church. We feel it. Oh, Steve, I'm not an emotional person. I, I don't feel things. No, I'm, a, I'm a more thoughtful sort of person. And in fact, it's, it's not really spiritual, is it, to be moving from your emotions? No, I don't mean feel it in your emotions. I mean feel it in your spirit. This is spirit to spirit, deep to deep. It's the, it's the burden of God that gets on you. And to build this church strong, there's got to be this sense of agreement amongst you. We all agree. Yes. We all agree. We feel what God feels for this place. It affects the way you go to work, the way that you mix with your neighbors and friends. When you go to the school gate and pick your kids up and interact with other families who are struggling, you feel something. I think what Nehemiah felt was just a touch of the grief of God over the state of his earthly address. And we have to catch that when we inter interact with people and engage with people as we do life with them. We must all feel what God feels. I, I wonder what you feel about this church. I wonder what you feel about <laughs> Grand Rapids. You know, on your good days, it's awesome. <laughs> on your bad days, it might not be. But your spirit has got to be so in tune with what God wants that it is always a good day. And that, that you allow what God feels to lift you from, oh, I don't like her and I don't like him. And oh, the children's work wasn't very good. My kids didn't enjoy it this week. Mm, oh, she was out of tune with the singing today. They weren't, by the way. But, they, <coughs> but we get whingy and we, get, we can get grumpy about aspects of church. No, if you feel what God feels about what you're building, what a noble task. What an awesome mission we have to build our lives together to be his address in this community. It means that when you go away on your holidays, you want to know, what did God say while I was away? I must get the podcast. I must have a listen. It means that when you listen to vision being cast, your heart lifts and you go, yes, I'm in. 
I feel it. It's right. It means that when new initiatives are birthed, you think, wow, what a great idea. Come on. You don't go, oh, not something else we have to go to. No, you feel what God feels. A people who feel it in the way I'm describing, I believe, really get the job done. And the truth is, some don't feel it. And my prayer today would be that you would have a suddenly. Amen. That God opens the eyes of your heart to see what he sees. See the brokenness around you. See what needs fixing. And that as you do life this week in Grand Rapids, you see it th through heaven's eyes, not through your human eyes. And that something goes on in your spirit that you feel what God feels. And that will galvanize you together as a church community yes. like nothing else. Really we must all agree, we feel what God feels. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Now, when you keep reading this story, I spotted something else. The end of chapter 2 and when you get into chapter 3, <clears throat> basically, they start the rebuilding. Josh, um, Nehemiah has got his team. They're all feeling what God feels. Come on, we can do this. Now, chapter 3 of Nehemiah, I have to admit, is one of those chapters in the Bible where you're quite tempted to skip over it. It's quite a few of those, if we're honest. You, you kind of get there and you suddenly become aware, oh, it's just a list of names, on to chapter 4. Stick with it. Because chapter 3 is literally a list of the builders. And it starts at the sheep gate and it takes you in a circle all the way around the city. That so this person built next to that person, next to that person. So I start reading it. Mindful, I'm in this sort of building process, and what I spotted was there's not a single builder amongst them. I mean, you read this, you read it yourself. The first guys that were building the wall were priests. I mean, what use is a priest building a wall? We all know that spiritual guys are so heavenly minded they're no earthly good. You know, if you're gonna, if you're gonna. Build a wall, you need stonemasons, laborers, guys who can mix cement or you know, do all the heavy lifting. And so you're looking for uh, the grunt. But priests. And then it, so it goes on. Look at verse, verse 8, for example. It says, Uzziel, son of Harumpha, one of the goldsmiths, repaired the next section. Goldsmith? You know. Next to him was a guy called Hananiah, one of the perfume makers. I mean, I want the wall to stand up, not smell nice. This is, this is crazy. Priests, goldsmiths, perfume makers. You keep reading down, there are shopkeepers, there are merchants, there are civil servants, local government officers. Verse 12 says that Shalom, ruler of half a district of Jerusalem, repaired the next section with the help of his daughters. Not just the guys. The girls are in as well. So, I mean, it's like... Where are the builders? The builders were just ordinary people. Welcome to church. People like you and me who felt what God felt. Because they felt it, there's a second implied building agreement here, which is simply this. We agree, guys. We're all going to get involved in this rebuilding process. We're all going to get involved. And the more I think that through, read this down. You bump into this phrase, um, where is it? Verse 23, it says that various priests made some repairs in front of their house. In front of their house. Verse 28, each made repairs each in front of his own house. Next to them, Zadok made repairs opposite his house. Huh. So some of them literally just got stuck in because it was where they lived. Where does building church really begin? It doesn't begin here. <laughs> no, it doesn't begin here. This is an event. This is a gathering. This is a place we come to be inspired and worship. Building church begins right where you live. It begins opposite your house. It's in the community. Because we build with living stones, right? Which are people. So building church starts with where you do life next to dead stones. People who are not yet made alive in Christ. 
who are still in the quarry face of this world. And as you engage with them in life, your heart is that you bring them to life. And they become a living stone and then you bring them and you start to build them in. The divine stone mason gets to work on them and together they become part of this community with us. The most regular word, common word in this chapter is the word next. So on to built next to, built next to, built next to, built next to. <laughs> no individual builders. Nobody off doing their own thing. Everybody's got somebody here. Somebody here. And when everybody's got somebody next to them either side, there are no gaps in the wall. And what God wants you to build gets built. His city, his address here in Grand Rapids gets built by you. Because there's a commitment. We all feel what God feels. Therefore, we will all get involved in the building process. This is not, building church is not a job for professionals. It's not, who we've got a pastor so we can always rest. We can just come to the show now. No. It's, it's community work. It's everyone involved. It's family. It's all hands on deck. And the truth is, we need every single person who gives their life to Jesus to start to be part of the building process, working with us. There's something everyone can contribute. And as you do, and you bring your life and add it in, you add something to the mix that we didn't have before. New skills, new ideas, new passions, new desires. You add them to the mix and help us to build this great expression of church. So, there's... You see what I'm saying? There's kind of an implicit building agreement between these builders in Nehemiah's day. They all felt what God felt. They all got involved in the building because of it. Now I see a third one, which I think is really important. If you keep reading the story, they work hard. And chapter 4, verse 6 says that they rebuilt the wall till it reached half its height because they worked with all their heart, and they have a bit of opposition, they keep building, and eventually you get to chapter 6, verse 15, and it says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in 52 days. That's pretty fast. That's less than two months. You know, it is amazing. It just shows you, if you will all feel what God feels, and all commit to getting involved in the building stuff happens now let me show you why it happens he says when all our enemies heard about this all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self confidence because they realized this work had been done with the help of our God (laughs) love it when you feel what God feels and you're all involved God breathes on it God helps God does what you can't do But the more you will put yourself into the building process, the more God smiles on it, breathes on it, does what you can't do. So the walls are up. It's kind of like, yo, job done. Man, this is awesome. Now there's a lot more to do. The city had to be repopulated. Um, Ultimately, uh, there's a lot of decisions to be made. Who's going to live in the city, live outside the city, get society back functioning again and so on. And Nehemiah led that process too. But somewhere in that journey, there was another suddenly. I think there was a, a light bulb, a eureka moment where the guy, the people suddenly realized, aha, uh-huh. we've got to make sure we never slip back into that mess again. Because the reason Jerusalem had been destroyed was they'd failed to walk in God's ways. They'd wantonly walked away from keeping God's law. And because of that, God had been true to his word and allowed their enemies to take them. And it must have dawned on them, all this work we've done, building the city, re-establishing God's address, we want to make sure this doesn't happen again. And essentially what happened is this. They get to a place where they realize we've got to reconnect with God's word. And you read about it in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verse 1 says this, All the people came together as one. Yes. So there's agreement amongst us. One mind, one heart. And it says, They told Ezra, the teacher of the law, to bring out the book of the law of the Moses that the Lord had commanded for Israel. And he begins to 
open the law and teach them. He says all the people listened attentively to the book of the law in verse 3. He says in verse 5 that as he opened it, all the people stood up and praised the Lord. And all the people lifted their hands and responded, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and worshipped the Lord. There's this reconnection going on between the people and God's word and ways. You know, the truth is this. Rebuilding the walls was a great success. And you could, you could say it was in response to a word. God wanted it doing, and they'd heard from God, but there's a higher word. There's an enduring word that they'd realized we have to reconnect with and start living by. Now, what I love, I love a couple of things about this, but one of them I particularly love is where the energy came from. The energy did not come from the leaders. The energy came from the people. Look at verse 1, it says, the people came together and they told Ezra to get the book of the law out. It's kind of like you guys gathering and saying, come on, we want to know God's word and ways. Uh, where, where's Andrew? Andrew, get your Bible out for goodness sake. Come on, teach us how to live. Teach us how to raise these kids, how to do business today. Teach us how to live as God's people. We want to know. And then when the book's open, because you're so hungry to know, it's as if you are going, yes, yes, amen, amen. It's the equivalent of what was happening here. The energy was with the people. They were wanting to give themselves, to devote themselves fully to God's word and ways. Too many churches today are still too front-led. It's me as the pastor or one of the leaders saying, come on, guys, read your Bibles. Come to the prayer meeting. You know, invite some people to your home. And we get worn out trying to get the people to do the right stuff. Whereas really we need the people to hear from God and catch the need to know and say, come on, teachers, leaders, guide us. I'm going to read my Bible. I'm going, to, I'm, I'm going to be with you to pray. And we're going to together make sure that this great thing God has given us to do together actually happens. The walls are a little bit like um, a project word, if I can use that language. And churches are generally really good at that. You, you've already done a lot of projects together. And you felt, yeah, it's what God wants us to do. So you think, right, we're going to, we'll, we'll acquire a building or we'll start a new ministry or <clears throat> we, know we need a vehicle. Come on, guys, we're going to launch this ministry and for it we need a vehicle. It's going to cost $20,000. And we all give, and then a Sunday comes where you arrive at church, and there's the new van with all the signage on it, and you all go, yes, didn't we do well? Well, that's kind of like the rebuilding the walls. Yeah. Only took them two months, and they must have walked through those reestablished gates and gone, yes, didn't we do well? Yeah. But the project word won't sustain you. Short-term stuff won't sustain you. There's a higher word. And that's what they've caught on to here in chapter 8. That the, the word of God that informs how we live our whole life, that word is the one we have to reconnect with. So I believe there was a third sort of implicit building agreement amongst these builders, which was, we all agree, we're going to respond to God's word as one. But when God's word comes to us in the projects, yeah, we've proved we can do that. But the living, enduring word, the scripture, for us, the new covenant, we will respond to that word as one. We're going to raise godly families. We're going to do business God's way. We're going to have community life that reflects heaven, not earth. We're going to do it together, on point, focused. That's what was going on here. I mean, they took it so seriously that as they began to respond to God's word as they understood it, it says in verse 17 that they, they, they celebrated the Feast of Booths, which, which happened to be that time of year. And it says it had never been done fully like that since the time of Joshua, hundreds of years before. 
And because they did, it says their joy was very great. <laughs> you want to be a church of joy, don't you? Yes. We want to be a community where people come in and they find there's the joy of the Lord that's our strength. There's liberty and freedom. Houses of joy. Because we're committed to living out the fullness of God's word. And as they continued to think of that process, they, they decided, we're going to do something physical to, ex, to, to demonstrate to God we're serious. Yeah. And if you read on through chapter 9, they literally did sign a piece of paper. They, they established a document on all their leaders, heads of households, priests, government leaders, they all make this agreement. In verse 38, it says, in, in view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites, and our priests will affix their seals to it. And I, I, in my mind, I see this queue of people queuing up to come and sign the document to say, I'm in. Yes. I'm going to keep God's word and ways, the whole of it, I'm in. Now, I'm not suggesting you do the physical thing, but in your heart, by the Spirit, you've yes, got to yes. do that. There's got to be a sense in which you, 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 you do sign up. You say to God, I'm in. <laughs> I feel what you feel for this community. So I'm going to be involved in helping build this great church. And I'm going to seek as best I know how to live in according to your word and your ways as it touches all and every aspect of my life. So we build your house, not our house. So it has the mark of heaven on it. We all agree. We feel what God feels. We will get involved in the building and we will therefore respond to God's whole word as one. Now, let me just throw one final thing in. Nehemiah, after this sort of high point, decided he did better go back and report to the boss. So he got on his donkey and went back to Babylon to report to the king. And it would seem he remained there potentially for 13 years before eventually coming back just to check that everything was still going okay in Jerusalem. So take the story on 13 years in your head. He's left. He's led it in awesome condition. He comes back still feeling what God feels, still prepared to be involved in the process, still committed to living by God's word and ways. And as he sort of you know, high fives all the guys in Jerusalem and reconnects with his friends and sees how the process has gone over the last 13 years, just a few things begin to trouble him. And he spots, hang on a minute, there's guys queuing up outside the gates of Jerusalem to trade on the evening before Sabbath. Why? Don't they know we keep the Sabbath? We don't trade on the Sabbath. And he discovers they've just let it slip and they started to trade on the Sabbath. Whoa, he says, this isn't right. Come on, we're going to sort this out. And he has them cleared away. He then is wandering around the temple and he comes to some of the rooms where they stored the tithes and the offerings that the, the priest lived off. And he sees it's full of junk. He goes, who's, who's is all this junk? No, household effects. And someone says, oh, well, this is Eliashib stuff. You see, um, uh, yeah, some, the priests have had to go back and work on the land because not all the tithes were coming in, so we let Eliashib keep his stuff in the room. And it's like, what? Get me some lads. We're going to get rid of this junk. We need God's stuff in this room. And so he gets the stuff moved out and gives them a real good telling off continues to walk around Jerusalem and what really pushed him over the edge was that as he interacted with people he began to spot some of these people can't speak Hebrew he would say hello to children and they'd answer him back with a quizzical look and then he realized they don't speak the language you read it in chapter 13 they did not know how to speak the language of Judah the language of praise now they would committed when they'd signed that agreement, that they wouldn't intermarry with other nations. Because that's part of the problem that had taken them to worship with the gods. Now he's cross. It's like, what is going on? 
I'm only away 13 years and it's, it's slipping. Before you know it, we'll be back in the mess again. He gets angry. He tells us in chapter 13 that he, he beat some of the men. He says he, he says he made them take an oath not to do it again. Now, how do you make someone take an oath? Except with their arm up the back and maybe a dagger to the throat. But he, he did something. He says he pulled out their hair and pulled out their beards. I mean, he got aggressive. He, he was steamed up. This was holy indignation because he was still feeling what God feels. He was like, what are you doing, guys? Come on. We felt it. We got involved and we built it. We committed to live by God's word and ways. And now you're beginning to live in contradiction to those words and ways. Get back in line. And that's kind of where the book finishes. I think we need a little bit of a Nehemiah spirit on us sometimes. Because we do feel what God feels, don't we? We've committed to be involved in building this great church. We've committed to live by all that the new covenant teaches as in Christ. But sometimes I forget. I drift. And my language maybe goes where it shouldn't. Or my behavior goes where it shouldn't. And I need you to come and put your hand on my shoulder and say, Steve, this isn't where we talk in the house of God, is it? Come on, back on track. Hey, that behavior's not fitting, is it? Come on, get back online. Let me help you. We have to be our brother's keeper. I don't want you to tear my beard out or rip my hair out. I don't want you to get a dagger to my throat. And, but spiritually speaking, we must have an agreement that says we will zealously protect what we're building. We will wholeheartedly protect this agreement. What we've agreed to do here is special. It's precious. It's unique. It makes heaven smile. And come on. We are all on a journey. We blow it sometimes. We're on a journey towards wholeness and becoming like Jesus. That's why we need to have a heart that says, please, if you see me drifting off, tell me. Have a vulnerability that gives access to each other, to be able to speak into each other's lives in love, to speak the truth in love, to keep us on the right trajectory so that what we build lasts. It's a tragedy to me when churches start strong and they thrive and you see them burgeon for five or six or seven years and then suddenly there's boom, there's something that wrecks it. It's because there's not this ethic in the mix. They get too full of their own energy or enthusiasm. They lose touch with what God feels. That it's His house. It's His word we have to keep. And we have to be willing to keep each other on point.